Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of I Know a Guy podcast. I'm excited about our guest today, Ed Potts. He's the nephew of Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's, the CEO, right? They did a big movie about the founder and how this gentleman back in the 50s, 60s, 70s made McDonald's the most famous fast food restaurant in the world, most successful. Well, his nephew is here. And he's going to tell you some inside family secrets that nobody knows that are not in the movie, that are not in the books. Ed Potts is on. Let's start. Uh, Ed Potts is in the house. Ed, first of all, thank you for coming uh, on the uh, this pod, the I Know a Guy podcast. Well, I know a family member of Ray Kroc, <laughs> the founder of McDonald's. And that's what I want to talk about. So the founder, you've seen the movie. Mm-hmm. Of course. How accurate is that movie in por- portraying Ray Kroc? Well, before we went and saw it, I had had told my wife, Reagan, that if it's accurate, and, and I've told this to anybody who was contemplating going to see it or ask, asking me if I had seen it, that in the beginning, if it's accurate, you're going to cheer for him, for Ray, because he's an underdog. Mm-hmm. You know, he had a, a lot of failed um, schemes and ideas that just never uh, panned out and uh, and when he hit it he he hit it big mm-hmm. right uh, so in the beginning you cheer for him because he's an underdog and by the end you feel like you need to wash your hands <laughs> yeah because uh, some of the the things that happen uh, in that story and and probably in a lot of cases where somebody makes that much money um, and friends, get crushed on the way up sure and uh and my grandfather had told me a lot of those stories and of the people who you know uh, got you know stepped on sure on on the way to the top so i thought the movie from that standpoint was incredibly accurate Uh, there were some things that were um, fictionalized because it was a movie it wasn't an autobiography but it didn't really affect the story the story was very accurate outside of the portrayal of the mcdonald's brothers as somehow being you know having <laughs> mcdonald's mcdonald's stolen from them yeah you felt sorry for them if yeah, you watched the yeah, movie you're like what yeah. did he do to them right. so real quick just to back up so your family how are you related to ray crock exactly so my my grandmother is lorraine crock is ray's sister and, and baby sister yeah. okay okay and so you you did you ever get to hang out with him at all Oh, he came to our uh, to our house in Brixton, uh, population fourteen hundred, um, in would have been probably nineteen seventy five, and um, I had flown into the airport at Purdue and and then uh, came in a limo, brought his his driver with him. Well, in Brixton, mm-hmm. you know, you, you never saw a limo, and um, and we were not a very diverse uh, community. Uh, he had uh, a, an African American limo driver in, in Brookston. We we had no diversity, so we, wow. we really didn't see a lot of of, of Latinos or African Americans. And so here's here's this guy pulling in with a driver who gets out and opens up the doors. All the kids in the neighborhood are riding up on their bicycles to figure out, you know, what's going on. And then he and my parents and and Joan, his his wife, uh, was with him, and they went out to dinner and joined my grandma and grandpa and and my mom's uh, two sisters, and they just stayed in town for a couple of days and visited some stores in the area. Um, uh, outside of that, it was you know, a rare family, you know, yeah. uh, get together. What year do you think that was? That seventy four, I would say seventy four was after. He had purchased the San Diego Padres. <laughs> uh, so someone yeah. would think that if your grandfather or your, or your I guess your yeah. uncle technically, grand mm-hmm. uncle, but your uncle is Ray Kroc, mm-hmm. you guys are multimillionaires then? Oh, well, no, no. I could, uh, I can tell you where that fortune went. <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, some did go to my, to my grandmother and to her um, uh, uh, brother. Uh, so Ray, it was Ray and my uncle Bob and and my grandma were the three uh, kids. Ray's only child had predeceased him. Uh, his first wife had predeceased him. Um, so what went to family uh, at when Ray died and Ray died in eighty four. The uh, my dad had passed in eighty one, and and I remember Ray calling uh, the house uh, to 
find out if we were okay. And, um, and my mom said yes. My grandfather and, and my Uncle Ray did not uh, get along for reasons I'm sure we'll cover in, as we, we move along. And uh, so, you know, there was no way my mom was taking a dime uh, from Ray while my grandfather was still living. Mm. Uh, so he took care of my mom when, um, when he passed. But the vast majority of his fortune went to Joan. And uh, they didn't have children together, and Ray's only daughter had had died mm -hmm. uh, before, um, so the fortune went to Joan's family. But the the vast majority of her fortune, uh, because it grew significantly after Ray died. The, I mean, the the uh, McDonald stock had sure. continued to split, and the value had soared. He had purchased the San Diego Padres, I believe, in 1969, 1970 for $9 million, the baseball <laughs> franchise for $9 million. Uh, she sold it for well over a billion. Um, and, and as you know, my, my Uncle Ray's from Oak Park, uh, Illinois, a huge, was a huge Cubs fan and uh, um, tried to buy the Cubs, but the Wrigley family wouldn't sell it. So he, he bought the Padres because they had a place out in uh, La Jolla. And uh, it was the year after Ray died that the um, Padres went to the World Series. Mm. And, uh, and, and she very wisely sold the team uh, after that. The value was at its top, absolute top dollar. maximum. At the time that Joan died, Ray's widow was one of the richest um, women in the United States, she gave what was at the time the largest single gift to a charity by an individual in history of $1.5 billion to the Salvation Army. Um, it was, they actually, the Salvation Army had to meet to discuss whether or not they could actually take it because their concern was it would impact future, future giving. Sure. Right, because of well, you don't need the money, uh, but it was uh, specific. It was very specific what she um, what she had in uh, in her will and how that money had to be utilized. And they had to build a building, uh, uh, Ray and Joan Croc mm -hmm. uh, Salvation Army Center, and so the, I think there are twenty six of them across the country. But they could not retrofit an existing building. They had to build a new building. So. You know, when you build a building, you you know this from from being a commissioner. You build a building, then there's maintenance and upkeep, and and you cannot, um, you just can't build a building unless your budget is going right. to be able to sustain it. And that wasn't how that money was geared to be used for uh, ongoing expenses. It was simply to build the, st the structure. She gave fifty million dollars to uh, Notre Dame. Uh, did not you know have like a. Uh, a note in there that said, and the Potts kids can go to Notre Dame for free. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, that she gave $50 million to Notre Dame, which at that time was the largest single gift ever given uh, by an individual to, to Notre Dame. And if you know, if from the founder, or if you've, you've read uh, Grinding It Out, which is Ray's autobiography, the most accurate information you're going to get about, about him is, is, is that book, Grinding It Out. Ray, says in grinding it out, the one thing I will never give money to is a university because he believed in, uh, he didn't graduate from high school, much right. less graduate from college. And look what he did. He, he is considered to be one of the most influential people of the 20th century. Right. And uh, along with Walt Disney and, and folks uh, like, like that. Uh, so he said, you know, uh, you learn more by doing. Right, and so, so for his wife to give fifty million dollars to a university was almost. Uh, she had her own ideas. She was much more on the democratic side politically. He was a uh, Republican. He was more conservative. She was more liberal. So you can see the gifts that she gave. Um, uh, again, hundreds of millions of dollars to the arts. She gave the largest gift ever given to NPR. Um, still to this day, listen to NPR. Every newscast, it will say, uh, and this new newscast is possible because the uh, of the Joan Croc Trust. Wow. Um, so it's a it's a, a constant gift that uh, was a very large amount that was um, 
uh, meant to sustain them for sure. forever. Uh, she she gave them, I believe, two hundred and fifty million dollars at the time. Their entire annual budget was ten million dollars. Wow! So uh, the so the Croc fortune went. Uh, of course, uh, over a hundred million dollars went to the Ronald McDonald House, uh, or Ronald McDonald Children's Charities. Um, uh, but she did tons of things in San Diego where she lived after Ray had died. Um, uh, it was uh, so the the stock. None of the stock went to the family. The stock went to to Joan. So your family growing up, you would probably say was middle class oh, yeah. or less and had worked even when he was making things happen. He was a big time. He's Ray Kroc. He owns the, mm -hmm. the Padres. You guys were still grinding it out and trying to make ends meet. Oh yeah. Now did your family own a McDonald's? Oh yeah. So, um, so my, um, uh, Ray is from Oak Park. My, my mm -hmm. grandma obviously grew up in Oak Park. My mom went to high school in Oak Park, Oak Park, River Forest high school. And, um, the uh, so when Ray um, started uh, McDonald's and and uh, you you know the story if you if you've watched the founders so you know he went out to San Bernardino mm -hmm. uh, because he was selling multi mixers um, at this time they were the the silver spindle shake machines mm -hmm. five spindles and the store out in California had ordered eight of them so. He was mystified why anybody would need to make 40 milkshakes at the same time. So he drove out, like in the movie, uh, visited the store, um, loved it. Mm -hmm. It was a little, maybe not even a thousand square foot building, octagon, windows all the way around. And uh, they just sold hamburgers, cheeseburgers, milkshakes, um, soft drinks, French fries. Mm -hmm. And... Um, he just loved the organization and the speed, no in indoor dining. Um, uh, just people would come to the window and, and, uh, he just said, uh, I want to, I want to franchise, I want to franchise your stores. And, um, they said, no, we've tried that. It, it didn't work. And uh, that's where a lot of people, the misconception is, um, you know, that he stole McDonald's from the McDonald's mm -hmm. brothers. They tried franchising. It, it didn't work. They mostly did it in the West, Arizona and, and, and uh, Nevada, I think, and parts of California. And those stores just didn't. Well, he paid them for the store, right? Oh, well, and, and the initial agreement was simply he's just like, let me find franchisees, pay me, pay me a fee, and I will find the franchisees and we'll expand. Um, so his percentage was 1.9% of the franchise fee that somebody would pay to own a McDonald's back then. It was 950 bucks. I've got to stop bucks. you and ask a question. Yeah. You're throwing out numbers here. Did you prepare before you got here or you've just known all this? Oh, I've written <laughs> every, from the time I was in grade school, I, I, I rooted for McDonald's. I would uh, advocate for McDonald's like I would advocate for somebody who was a White Sox fan. You know, I would advocate for the Cubs. If it was, uh, you know, I'm a conservative, so a Republican, you know, versus a Democrat, Purdue versus sure. Indiana. So uh, bring your mic uh, a little bit closer. Okay, sure. Yeah. So when, Much better. Oh, there when we go. Uh, I remember a kid moved to our town, and again, we're a tiny little town, 1400 then, 1400 uh, now, just uh, 10 miles from Purdue. And a kid had moved to town, and somebody said, well, Ed's dad has a McDonald's in Lafayette. And he goes, I've never eaten at a McDonald's. He might as well have told me he was from Mars. The yeah. idea that somebody <laughs> hadn't eaten at ever. McDonald's ever was, I mean, because we ate at McDonald's. We ate at McDonald's a lot. But we always paid at the counter um, like, like uh, regular customers. Uh, now we did get to, like, we could take our lunch and go to the um, – go down in the basement in mm -hmm. Indiana, you would, you'd have basements. And, and they had a basement with all of their stock, all the boxes with the cups and the packaging and things like that. And and we would kind of make a tunnel in the boxes and then eat our lunch, you know, kind of make a, a little uh, clubhouse kind of thing. Um, and and as I grew up, uh, I'm the oldest of, of uh, the grandkids, the oldest of the nieces and nephews. The uh, 
so I got to go to work with dad more often and you know, I couldn't go in the kitchen, but I could wipe tables off and um, take trash out. And that to me was, you know, was amazing. So every report that I had to write from whatever grade you start writing reports, it wouldn't matter what the topic was. I could find a way to make that report McDonald's. about McDonald's, right? Uh, and, and I did that through, uh, through college. Um, again, uh, the, um, whether it was the, the success of, of Ray, you know, and the vision you have to have. I, I always say uh, when, you, when you talk about Ray and you talk about the McDonald's, brothers they they tried to franchise it didn't work but but when they signed the agreement with ray he got 1.9 percent of the franchise fee but half a percent of that 1.9 so that the half percent came out of his cut went to the mcdonald's brothers uh, just because he wanted to use their name and he wanted to use what they called the speedy service system mm -hmm. that's how they how they uh, ran their kitchen and um, so what, what happened was he built, Ray built his first store in Des Plaines, Illinois. So it's cold, right? right? Well, the, the agreement was very limited in regards to changes you could make. The, the McDonald's brothers were like, if you're going to keep our name, then you have to do it our way. Um, so the way in which you, you prepared the food, um, the, the style of the restaurant, everything – uh, including like the air conditioning and the heating and that kind of thing had to be the same. So every time he wanted to make a change, he had to go to the McDonald's brothers to get that approved, which slowed down the process. And Ray knew he had, he had found a winner. And he, uh, uh, he, so he has franchisees lined up and, uh, and the McDonald's brothers are slowing down his progression. So what happened um, is, and it, it's portrayed accurately in the movie, he meets, he's actually going to the bank to get a loan because he wants to buy them out. This is around 62, 63. Mm -hmm. He wants to buy them out. And um, the, the, the McDonald's brothers originally told Ray no when he came out and visited. And they said, they pointed to a house up behind the San Bernardino restaurant and said, that's where we live. And we're perfectly fine here. That's why their franchises didn't work because they didn't go visit those stores. They were, um, I mean, so strong in what they did with the original location. That was my question. That's, like, why? what did Ray do differently than they did? Why did they not have success? So absentee ownership rarely works, right? So when they franchised, they didn't go run those restaurants. They, they asked those guys to run them the way they ran theirs, but they, they didn't. They didn't. They weren't as diligent. So those guys continued to take care of their, their primary location, and they just said, someday we hope to sell it, and we'd, we'd like to get a million dollars each, and when we do that, we're going to retire, and we'll be, we'll be done. So in 1963, Ray is going to give them a million dollars each, mm -hmm. and a million dollars in 1963. A lot of money. It's a lot of money. And uh, banks wouldn't give him a loan. There was an attorney somewhere near where Ray was having a conversation with this banker and, and overheard enough to where he stopped Ray outside the bank and said, tell me, can I, can I ask you, tell, tell me about what it is you're trying to do. And he, he ends up having a meeting. This guy's name was Harry Sonneborn. He was a, a young attorney. And he said, he's explaining to Ray, this is not a good business. You're getting... You're getting 1.9% of a franchise fee. This isn't sustainable. And you got he had a 10-year contract mm -hmm. with McDonald's Brothers. So he said, tell me about the land. And uh, he said, what do you mean? He says, well, who owns the land? He says, the, the franchisees. We, you know, uh, they're buying the franchise rights, but they'll find the property, and then they're going to build the building and so on and so forth. And he said, well, that's your – that's your mistake. You're in the. You think you're in the wrong business. You're you're not in the hamburger business. You're in the real estate business. So he said, you need to buy the property and then lease the property to the franchisee. Franchisee is going to pay that lease. It's a it's a, a, a it's an eternal lease. It's they never own the land. They own the building, and that plan at McDonald's is 
still exists. It's a, it's a base rent, a so franchisee. McDonald's, McDonald's currently, yeah. someone owns the McDonald's franchisee or a franchise? A franchise franchisee owns the building and the equipment. But not the land. But not the land. Still to this day. Right. Unless you have, like, my grandfather. My grandfather was an early franchisee. My grandfather owned his own land. So the um, there's not very many of those folks uh, left. So there might be a handful. Um, but uh, so... So when that happened, Ray formed um, a McDonald's a real estate company, a, a separate company, uh, because he didn't need the McDonald's brothers involved in this because these people were buying their mm-hmm. own land. So he's the one that developed the, the real estate system along with Harry Sonneborn. So now the, 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 the lease of the land, that money is going to Ray, to Ray's company. Wow. And and then he's he's bringing in more money than the McDonald's brothers are bringing in, so he then had the power and offered to buy them out. They said no. He um, he was able to get the money from the bankers because they'll loan you money for real estate. They won't loan you money for a restaurant. So when when they they saw the fl- income flow that was going to be created, he bought the McDonald's brothers out. Uh, for a million dollars, actually a million two each, but a million dollars after taxes um, in 1963. So in essence, oh, that's why I, I say the McDonald's brothers did not get screwed over. The McDonald's brothers got paid $1.2 million gross each for one single successful restaurant. The Their, their franchise attempt um, did not work. Um, so McDonald's, as we know it, it was created by Ray Kroc. He simply honored their system and their name. And they never got – so when, he, when they sell the restaurant and Ray Kroc purchased it, does Ray pay royalties to them or it's nothing? No. There were ne- never royalties. He got – they got until they sold – until they sold. Uh, when Ray bought them out, they had a half a percent of the McDonald's Corporation. I mean, so certainly they'd have been better off. Their heirs would have been better off not selling sure. to Ray and keeping the half half percent. But the um, – so that was, again, when I would write a paper about one of the greatest business decisions in history was a million two uh, right. to each of the McDonald's sure. brothers to, to get back a half percent share of what – became the McDonald's Corporation, so Fortune 500 company. The restaurant your family had, what happened to that? And did Ray visit that site or help you guys? Or So that that um, that will that story will help uh, explain the relationship between my grandfather and, okay. and Ray. And your grandfather, you're talking about Ray's sister's husband? Yes. Okay. okay. So, so Hank Grow, Hank and Lorraine, Lorraine Grow. So my grandparents... Um, because growing up, again, because I'm the oldest, I got more of a chance to spend time with my granddad, and, and he would tell me stories. I know he told me stories so that I could tell them sure. to my siblings and to my cousins. And and um, I've never really done it in a format like this. Most people, only because I know you personally, most, sure. most people have no idea about the, the Ray Kroc thing because – I'm very proud of what my father and my grandparents, what my mom and dad and what my grandparents accomplished. The um, So my grandfather was an accountant uh, for J.L. Craft in Chicago. Um, they had lived in, in uh, Oak Park, um, you know, as did Ray. Ray was still in Oak Park when he began uh, McDonald's. The um, My grandfather had issues with Ray, you know, Kind of his get rich quick schemes, well documented uh-huh. in the in the movie, um, accurate again, and um, he he didn't think Ray was very dependable because when my great grandmother uh, Ray's mom uh, got sick, she stayed with my grandma and my grandpa, who were um, in no huge financial you know position. Uh, Ray didn't help, didn't visit, so my grandfather did not think. A great deal of him. But as I got older, I remember asking my grandpa, you always talk about how you don't respect 
you know, Uncle Ray, but um, why would you have gone into business with a man you didn't respect? And he said, uh, I don't respect him, but I, I knew the <laughs> business was, he, he had finally, after years of, of failing to, uh, to find that one thing, this was a great business model. Sure. And, and he's an accountant, so he, he, he knew how to run the numbers. He, he worked for J.L. Craft at, the, at an executive level, really from the time he graduated from the University of Illinois, another reason why the two of them didn't get along. Uh, my grandfather valued education, and Ray didn't. Um, so when my grandfather um, chose to, to pursue a franchise um, with his brother-in-law, who he didn't really love, he left craft uh, after 30 years. As in craft, uh, as in the like jail ranch craft, dressing? Like, no, like jail craft, wow. like uh, che- the craft cheese. And, wow. And, um, and he worked for... Mr. Kraft. <laughs> so when he when he left, you know, that's a hard thing to do. And in your probably he was probably fifty. Right? So how how many franchises are, are are there right now, you think, at this at this time when in, he's leaving in Kraft? Worldwide? When he's leaving Kraft. Oh, 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 less than a hundred, maybe seventy. And so Kraft's probably like, Why are you leaving yes. me to go to that? Yeah, he his he he looked at at Mr. Kraft as a mentor, as a father figure. And thought because he was going to open his own business, he would get patted on the back. And he, I think he told me, Mr. Pratt and his boss, uh, his direct boss, had told him, um, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. <laughs> so he was afraid that might happen because they had wanted him to move to New York to take over um, handling state taxes for Kraft corporately. And um, he didn't want to go to New York. And he knew uh, at that time, you said no to that kind of a move. Your your it's future over. is 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 bleak. So my grandma and my mom and her two sisters moved to Lafayette, Indiana, West Lafayette, um, where Purdue is. Uh, that's where the location was going to be. Um, McDonald's um, talks about to this day. Um, that back in the day, that they would find locations. Ray would be in a plane or a helicopter, and he'd point to a place, and he'd say, that's a great spot for a McDonald's, and then they'd go buy the property. Well, that was BS when it came to my grandpa. They just said, where do you want a location? And he said, how about how about West Lafayette, Indiana? Because my mom was going to Purdue. Uh. And uh, and so my mom was like, I was going to Purdue to you know, get away from home <laughs> and basically her you know, her parents followed her. So there was no real thought other than it was a college town, and my grandpa thought it would be a, a good location. And it, it it turned out to be a fantastic location on some some really cool stuff. I have uh, McDonald's history um, uh, conversations between Ray Kroc and, and the McDonald's brothers that were on dictaphone uh, tapes uh, that I got as a gift for my grandma. And I, I was reading through the transcripts, uh, re- reading through them last night just to refresh my memory. And it, in a conversation in 1957, talks he's talking to the McDonald's brothers uh, about what locations are coming on uh, board. And he said, my, my sister and, and her husband, uh, Hank and Lorraine Grow, are opening a store in West Lafayette. We think it's going to be great. And, and it, it turned out to be the number one store in the company. Uh, so it, it hit the ground running, and, and it was probably maybe the 70th contract. And then I think the McDonald's stores are numbered by uh, – you can see that when you get a receipt at McDonald's. You'll, you'll look, and it'll say store number sure. whatever. Like the store here in Alachua was, I think, store number 11,000 or something like that. The um, – so there's still only a handful of, of, of franchises sp- spread around the country, pretty much where Ray knew people. Um, the uh, store did great. Uh, my my dad was a Purdue student just working at McDonald's, and, and he and my mom, my mom was working while she was a student also. Um, and then they began dating, and then my dad ended up, you know, uh, being – the, the manager and, and and really running the store on a day-to-day uh, basis. But the store was uh, in the levee on the Wabash River in West Lafayette, 
and uh, this was early, maybe a couple years into their uh, ownership, Wabash River flooded, flooded out the store, flooded out the whole levee, and my grandparents had sunk all of their money in uh, to, to this store. And um, so he calls Ray and says, we need, we need a loan. I mean, uh, we, we lost all of our stock. Everything in the basement was, was ruined. And, and he said, well, I'm not going to loan you the money, but I'll buy the store back. Wow. And my grand, grandpa said, well, we're the number one store in the company. You, you know we're, we're good for it. And my, my grandpa's trying to make the business argument, not this is your sister. Sure. You know, for the right. love of family. You. Uh, he, he's saying, we're the number one store in the company. You know we're, we're good for it. We put everything into this. And he said, I'm not going to loan you the money. I'll buy the store back from you. So um, Was that story in the movie? No. Because that's a good one. Yeah. it's it's uh, No, that, that's not in there. But, but that would have painted Ray in a light that they didn't really want him to be pictured in that light until the end when it okay. looks like he's screwing over the McDonald's brothers. So... Uh, my mom, her two sisters, their husbands, my dad, yep. my grandma and grandpa ran that store for three years by themselves. They brought in students to run lunch hour. There was no breakfast back then. Uh, there was no indoor seating at the, at, during that time. Um, so they just brought students in and, and housewives to to work the lunch rush and the dinner rush. Other than that, just family, ran that store for three years. My grandpa was able to get his banker to uh, allow him to pay interest only on his loan. Um, I mean, what a... So Ray never a, gave any money. He never, was like, I'm never, not, I'll buy it, but I'm not giving it to you. Never gave him uh, a dime. And and my grandpa, in, in three years, uh, had uh, the, the store continued to be uh, phenomenal. And in three years, he had paid off the, his entire note. So uh, he... So they never really saw eye to eye. My grandfather formed what was at the time called OPNAD, which was the operators, basically like a owner operators union, so that when you hear those commercials for McDonald's, it says uh, free Big Mac promotion, uh, individual owner participation may yes, vary. Yes. You know, that's that's was my grandpa who who fought for that that uh, that the company can't give away your items because remember the business model for McDonald's in a, in an owner operated store, a franchise store is you're paying a base rent to McDonald's, let's say 15% of your gross. Um, so McDonald's doesn't really care from a corporate standpoint about your profit margin as a owner operator because they're getting 15% of your gross. And they're also getting paid for the land. Right. Right. Well, I mean, you're getting paid for the land through that 15%. Okay. Okay. That's, okay. Your, that's your base rent is what they call it. Um, so that that stream of income to McDonald's is, is why, again, they're one of the largest holders of real estate in the, in the world. The, um, uh, the business model is, is fantastic. It's why that stock is still, I mean, it's at, at yesterday morning. I haven't seen what the market's doing today, but yesterday morning um, they reported uh, their earnings. I listened to that uh, stockholder mm-hmm. uh, meeting on my uh, on my headphones while I was walking in Turkey Creek. The uh, uh, you that stock went when it went public, and my grandparents, um, who were wealthy, very wealthy on their own, my grandparents made their money on McDonald's stock. I mean, they had a wonderful store. They had a terrific store, but today. Uh, you talk to the successful franchisees uh, like the folks in in Gainesville. You know they own the entire Gainesville market. You have uh, I have friends who who are franchisees that own multiple you know locations. So you know um, it's stressful. It's stressful running a restaurant. So imagine running eight or ten of them. Sure, right, which is what a lot of these folks do um, run multiple uh, franchises. The uh, but when my Grandparents bought McDonald's stock. Again, he had paid off his debt. So when McDonald's stock went public, now he had money and he dumped everything into McDonald's stock. And, uh, and of course, it split and it split and it split. And they gifted hundreds of shares. They gifted shares to us kids and grandkids for, for years to, um, to the maximum amount of a uh, annual gift you can give um, uh, to 
spread the stock out because my grandpa, who was thrifty to say the least, right. would say the Uncle Sam's going to get a lot less from you guys than they're going to get from me if, if I sell sure. that stock. Um, so I remember, and then as a financial advisor, I would always talk to clients about this. When you're buying stock for your children, I would suggest, at least initially, to get the checks the old-fashioned way. So when a stock pays a dividend, quarterly dividend, the stock, the check comes to your house, and and you show your children. This is it's, it's if you bought stock in their name, the, the uh, check's going to come. It's in their name, mm-hmm. and you're explaining to them you own a part of McDonald's or Walt Disney or Apple or whatever right. stock you're buying. And, uh, and this is you, – you're getting paid a share of the profits because you're a stockholder. I said, then your kids understand what it is they really have. Right. So when we would sit around the table with the f- five of us kids, McDonald's checks would come, and Dad would have us all – you know, we had to, you, know, you have to sign your real name, Edward R. Potts. You can't just, you know, print it. You have to sign. And and they always explained, you know, what it, what it was. So to me, that's the way to buy stock for your kids so that they truly understand what, what it have. is. And and maybe buy a stock in a company that they they use their goods. So whether it's a Nike or, or some such thing, a lot of kids own, own Disney stock. But uh, to me, that was meaningful. Uh, um, so my grandfather's uh, store uh, recovered. Um, that store is at 212 Brown Street Levy. Uh, the, um, it stayed in that location until after my grandfather had, had died. Um, and, uh, are, we, and then, are we in the 80s now? So my, my dad died in 81. My, grand, my grandfather and my grandmother uh, both died later than my dad. But back at 212 at, at Brown Street, the original location, once they, they got themselves um, back on their feet, they opened a second location, 1969, uh, 1970, by the time it was finished, a uh, store uh, on Stadium Avenue in um, 605 Stadium Avenue in West Lafayette, right by Mac Arena. So very much like the, the McDonald's store, that was before they moved it around the corner on university, that proximity, maybe even closer as far as to the physical football and basketball stadium. When it, uh, when it opened and we had to block the doors open because of the lines, it was in- incredible, but it opened in the summer. School had just let out. So for those first few months, tough. Oh, I thought this was a terrible decision. And my dad opened the first store in Lafayette, so West Lafayette, Lafayette separated by the Wabash River. Uh, my dad's store was in Lafayette, so he was a franchisee probably at, at 32. Um, uh, he, was, he ran the stores for my, for my grandpa, so he was the general manager, and, uh, and then he had his own uh, franchise. Unfortunately, shortly after he opened his franchise in, in 74, he had a heart attack. Mm. Um, Obviously, I, I was too young uh, to, to take over. Uh, my grandpa was trying to retire, so my dad had already bought him out of the original store uh, on Brown Street. So uh, the decision was made because my mom's uh, – my dad had his heart attack at 35, so my mom is a 34-year-old potential widow with five kids under the age of 14. Wow. So um, the decision was made to sell the market – to McDonald's, and my grandpa, he must have told me this story 50 times, and then I'd hear, you know, kind of my my dad's version of this, which which differed. My dad didn't finish uh, college. My grandpa was always the smartest guy in the room. Um, he would tell you that he was the smartest smartest person in the room. So they negotiated with, with McDonald's, and um, uh, they get to a price, and my dad would say, "Take it, take it, take it." And my grandpa would say, yes, I, "You know, I got this." Yep. And he finally got the number that he wanted from all the lawyers uh, at McDonald's headquarters, and so they said, "Well, then we're ready. Sign the papers." And he goes, "No, now you send the old man in." Wow. And because uh, he he said, you know, the um, once he knew he had the number, he felt 
that was fair from the company. Then he's going to get Ray to come in and make it happen, and, and well, and to enhance it. This is this is Sue Potts. This is your niece. Right. She has five kids. Her husband is he's not going to live a normal life, and so then he got the enhancement that he probably should have gotten when his store was underwater right. in 1957 and 1958. And um, and so, you know, it kept my mom from having to work. But um, for me, um, again, being a diehard Cub fan and a diehard Purdue fan, um, I was a diehard McDonald's fan. So now I'm 14, 15 years old. Um, you're starting to think about college. And, yeah. And... Um, and they brought just my my next brother Tom, who's a year younger than me, and I into the kitchen and said, "What would you boys think if we sold the stores?" Wow. And I'm like, "What are you talking about? You you all I wanted to do was do what my dad did, right, and what my grandfather did. It really wasn't about at Ray, because again, I we were." middle class. Um, we had probably the nicest house in our, our, our little town, and we had a pool. I mean, everybody came to our house because we, we had a pool. Sure. It wasn't, well, we didn't have a lot of that. But we, um, you know, my grandparents, they had money. They traveled the world. They, they, they did things, but they didn't have five kids at home, right? They, they had the freedom to do that. I, I think the only vacation I remember my parents taking um, was um, to Hawaii for the McDonald's um, franchisee convention like in 1971 and my I, I remember all the, the stuff they brought back and all the pictures and things like that outside of that what are you gonna do you have five kids it's not like we'd go out to eat um, we had one of those station wagons you know where the third seat, in the station, I faced out the back yes. window, like from vacation. <laughs> uh, the uh, so uh, so that was that. I knew. Well, now I got to go to college, right? The uh, the option of 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 taking over uh, the business and, and it wasn't and, happening because they sold it, right? They they sold it. So when uh, when I turned sixteen, um, sixteen in a day, I think in Indiana was when you could get your driver's license. Um, I drove to McDonald's in Lafayette, the one that my dad owned um, uh, before they'd sold it, filled out an application like every other kid and worked at McDonald's all through high school, all through college. And um, You went to college at Purdue? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I had that conversation with my dad. I don't want to re rehash yeah. anything, but yeah. I picked them to win it all this year. <laughs> so, and they don't. busted. I know they busted my bracket. Ed. I'm a I'm a Cub fan and a <laughs> Purdue fan, so heartbreak in the in the sports world is nothing, nothing new. But I remember my dad at, at a visit. My as busy as the store would get at the McDonald's store would get on game day. Um, we never missed kickoff, and so <laughs> probably didn't throw my grandfather. But my dad had a really good staff, and uh, it didn't matter how busy we were. We we didn't miss kickoff. Sure. And uh, the uh, uh, so it was, you know, at, at Purdue, I think he said, well, this is where you're going to go to school someday. And I said, well, Dad, what if, what if I don't want to go to Purdue? What if I want to go to wherever, you know, Illinois? My grandfather had graduated from the University of Illinois, and he said, oh, son, I, if I didn't make it clear, you can go to school anywhere you want, but if you want me to pay for it. You go to Purdue. Purdue. <laughs> so it was, it was, it was Purdue. The uh, so the McDonald's experience for me, and and there will be friends of mine from from Lafayette, lifelong friends of mine that I worked with at McDonald's who will listen to this uh, podcast. That's wonderful to see how accurate <laughs> how accurate it is. And if like so many of the stories, my family, uh, my kids, my uh, brothers and sisters will say, uh, my stories get enhanced over the years, but the stuff in regards to McDonald's, the stuff in regards to Ray's history, there's lots of places you can go and find sure. this information. Um, but the... Um, Did you go to college and still work at McDonald's or then oh, yeah. graduate went, and try to work at McDonald's? Or So I, I went to um, I went to school uh, to... Uh, I worked shifts. I became a, a swing manager. And so I, I got to 
I think I was, I didn't work my freshman year at Purdue. Um, I was a basketball manager for the basketball team. And that's a, that's a lot of time. And, um, but over the summer I went back and they, they uh, asked me to be a swing manager. So I had keys to the, to the store, the new store they had built out um, by the interstate. And, um, and so I worked every breakfast shift every Saturday and Sunday for about four years. Uh, I'm I, every Saturday and Sunday. So, but I'd get in, I'd be in there at five o'clock and I'd be I'd, at two o'clock. I did the deposit, went to the bank and I'm done. Did, uh, did the people that were there you were working with know oh, heck, who Uncle yes. Ray is oh, and, yeah. and who you are? Yeah, most because, because the managers were people that had worked for my dad and for my okay. grandfather. okay. So they they knew who my dad was. They knew who my granddad was. And and if if you didn't know, they would say, "Well, you know that that guy over there, his <laughs> uncle is you know Ray Croc." The um, but but we didn't have a you know an ongoing relationship. I I would always I was the oldest, and and I always invited because I would say to my mom and dad, my dad would say something like, "Ray, Ray doesn't have time for that." And I said, well, I'm inviting all my other great aunts and uncles. Why would I not invite mm -hmm. Uncle Ray? So, um, so which was a smart thing to do since he gave me the biggest check that I got for my <laughs> high school graduation. <laughs> and he gave me a signed copy of uh, Grinding It Out. The, uh, but the things that I, I regretted is as we got older, especially my, br my younger brother and I, um, that we didn't you know, call and go out to San Diego to see a ball game and just to visit uh, with them and, and go to the ranch. I remember Ray. Would he have welcomed you out there? Oh, my gosh, yes. So when Ray came, you asked about him visiting right. uh, us. And, and when he came to Brookston, and he had a great time. And and so they said, we're going to fly you all out uh, to the ranch in La Jolla for, for Christmas. And um, and we're going to fly a plane in to, to Purdue. We'll pick you up, make it nice and easy. And my... Grandfather got wind of that and said, any one of you gets on that plane, you're not a member of this oh. family. <laughs> so the, the uh, you know, you weren't going to cross my grand my grandfather. And this was post him not helping with the store? Oh, yes. So oh, yeah. This is, would have been in, this would have been in, uh, in the seventies, right? So, so is this, it, it, would that store kind of be like the, the nail in the coffin where there are already kind of previous issues between the grandfather yeah, and the... My, yeah, my grandfather, and I don't know that, that, Uncle Ray necessarily had an issue with my grandfather. My grandfather had an issue with right. Ray, uh, reliability and and that kind of thing. And then my grandma, even though they're siblings, um, my grandma did not like the fact that the movie sort of shows it accurately, but the minute that McDonald's was, the minute that Ray signed the deal, got the loan, and was getting paid, he dropped... He, he, his wife was gone. Uh, that wow. was, boom, she was out the door. And so um, she stayed with him through all of, all of his things that didn't work. And in the book, in his book and in the movie, it makes it sound like more she was not supportive of, of McDonald's, that he was, that this was, he was going all in and she wasn't for that. Now he, he dumped her. He had been having an affair with Joan um, for, a number of years, the movie portrays it. They just skip his second wife that he married in the middle. They, wow. they don't show that. But the only reason he married the, the the second woman, Jane Dobbins, is because Joan wouldn't leave her husband because she didn't think he was making enough money. And then when he was making enough money, he he's married, and she says, "I'm ready now." And then he dropped the second <laughs> wife. <laughs> And, and I feel like and, we're in England where the king has yeah, like eight wives or something. Yeah. They were in love. Uh, or he was in love with her. That was his, you know, I mean, he uh, he loved Joan, no question about it. But uh, she wasn't going to leave her um, her husband until she knew he was, he had solidified Arrived. his yes. uh, money. And then she, you know, she, uh, again, uh, say what you want. My grandma was not... Uh, as much as my grandfather disliked Ray, my grandmother disliked Joan. So um, the uh, so when Ray died, uh, my 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 dad had died two years prior. When Ray died, we we went to the funeral in uh, Chicago, bitterly cold, so cold that you know your 
the doors on your car froze shut wow. from the wind chill. There's really no family. Remember that you've got um, uh, my uncle Bob, raised brother Bob, and his uh, daughter, and their children. Uh, my mom, uh, her two sisters, their their kids. Um, that's it. The rest of the family would have been Joan's children from her prior prior marriage. So when we we go, um, we get picked up by a limo. The 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 funeral was in Oak. Oak Brook, right by McDonald's headquarters, but they they broadcast it back on uh, on, on TV to the headquarters because you couldn't fit everybody in the church, and so we're sitting in the front row, and rode over in, in the limo, and um, my brother says to me, um, "Yeah, I know these guys behind us. I just can't picture uh, who they are," and I, I look back and I said, "Hmm." Well, that's Steve Garvey. Is this in the church? This is in the church. Okay. Uh, Steve Garvey is a first baseman for the Padres, was a, a longtime, you know, uh, uh, L.A. Dodger. Buzzy Bavese, who was the president of the San Diego Padres. Bowie Kuhn, who was the president of Major League Baseball. And Eddie Einhorn, who was the owner of the Chicago Bulls and the Chicago White Sox. And I said to my brother, that's who they are. And they're sitting behind us, right? <laughs> that was pretty cool. Sure. And so, as we we went to the hotel, back to the hotel, my grandma said to me, "Give your grandma a kiss. Have you ever kissed a millionaire?" And um, my my grandparents, I'm quite sure, if they weren't already millionaires, would have been millionaires had they not gifted all that stock to thirteen grandchildren and to their to their children, and their son-in-laws. Wow. But my, I'm quite sure that Ray gave her that money to just have one last jab at my grandpa, because <laughs> I can tell you a story. My, my grandparents always had a place in Indiana, and then they had a place in Florida, and they would go back and forth. The, um, my grandma wanted to have a car. She just didn't want to have to borrow a car when we came back, and, and, or they didn't want to have to drive. And my grandpa said, it's ridiculous. We're not going to buy a car and leave it here for half the year. And my grandma said, well, I'm buying a car and I'm buying this condo. And and it was like that son of a bitch, Ray, <laughs> one last shot uh -huh. that he gave her that money just so she could tell him, I'm going to do what I want to do. And uh, the... Uh, and they did, you know. They they continued to to travel back and forth. After my my as my grandpa had gotten sick, and I remember going to see him in the hospital. Literally, he's 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 going to die a couple of days later from uh, emphysema. And there was an article in the paper that the the original store, the two twelve Brown Street store in West Lafayette, um, they were moving it. They were moving the store from the the two twelve. Brown Street, just across River Road on the hill, which means they had a, a they owned that property. That was one of the few locations where you owned the property. Right. And my grandpa, I can't use the language, but he just said, those blankety blank idiots, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that lease went through whenever. And, uh, and he said, and they don't know the minute you cross River Road in West Lafayette, you would know, like in Florida, where do where do the regular Gainesville residents, what do they consider to be campus, right? Sure. There's the the, the actual campus lines, and then there's the perceived campus lines. And in, in Lafayette, regular folks don't cross what they perceive to be campus. They don't want to go to restaurants on that side. They they just stay off campus when school's in session. And and on top of that, he says they're also going to have to pay to get access because there was no access off of River Road. He said I, that's, that's going to cost him a fortune. It was on a hill. It needed a, at least a million or more dollars worth back in. This would have been 80 80, say 89, 90, they would have to build a wall to hold back the, the ground to build the store in that location. So um, they did it. 
and that store closed three years later. Wow. The most successful McDonald's store um, closed, uh, and, and my grandpa was exactly right. They moved it across River Road. People didn't like um, feeling like they were going to campus, and, um, and then it opened uh, shortly later as a uh, franchise store. So the company had taken over my dad's store and my grandparents' store, and they were running that as what they call Macopco stores, stores run by the company uh, with a, a managers that they appoint, no ownership interest. Uh, when the store closed, they sold it to a franchisee. McDonald's wouldn't close a store unless they knew that store couldn't be profitable. Then if somebody's willing sure. to buy it, then the guy bought it and opened it up. And so the store may be profitable now, but he had to do – he had to invest and, and be patient, waiting for that to come back. So I, I say my grandpa, who always considered himself to be the smartest person in the room, you know, two days before he dies, is saying, those people are idiots. idiots. And and he was exact exactly sure. right. So let me ask you a question yeah. about, about Ray Kroc. He do this alone? Was he, I mean, was he by himself? Hey, I'm going to buy the stores, and nobody was really with him, and nobody believed in the story, and I'm, I'm going to make it happen. So, so as much as there are folks like the, he had a falling out uh, with, um, with, you know, the guy who helped him design the real estate partnership. Right. Uh, they they had a falling out, and then got back together when Ray had his 75th birthday party. But, uh, but a lot of Ray's people from the very be beginning, his first grill man. Fred Turner became the CEO of McDonald's. When when Ray left, Fred Turner became the CEO. So I'd certainly say he took care of, of Fred. Sure, yeah. The uh, June Martino, who was his secretary at the multi-mixer company, Prince Castle. Uh, June Martino retired probably with $100 million uh, because of her stock ownership. And she served on the board of directors of McDonald's. Uh, she served with him. Uh, and I, I think she... She was probably the last of that group to, to pass away. Um, uh, very loyal to her. Um, many of the owner operators um, and the original people who worked in the office building it for, for really for the first, probably from 54 to 57, when he, between the time he first met the McDonald's brothers and, and he um, really took off with franchising, it was just him and June Martino. Just him and his secretary, the Prince Castle yeah. secretary. So, um, so there were folks that that he took along with him, and then there were folks that they had disagreements along the way. The vendors, some of the vendors, um, uh, Perlman Roque um, and uh, Martin Brower companies, um, they're vendors to this day. Um, uh, according to the book, Ray never had a contract. It was a handshake with Mr. Perlman, uh, and they. They supplied all the paper, so back then all the sandwiches were wrapped in right. wax paper yep. um, to every franchise in, you know, in the world, right? Because McDonald's, the one thing it should be is consistent. When you eat anywhere, a double cheeseburger should. Well, I've been over to I've been to Europe and uh, shoot downtown. I say downtown Paris. Um, um, I mean, literally near some of all the amazing sites, and if you don't speak French, and I don't. Mm -hmm. Um, you see the arches, the golden arches. You go, okay. I feel, <laughs> I feel a little more comfortable now. There are pictures of me and a McDonald's in every country we visit because wow. Reagan's given up trying to, you know, convince me not <laughs> to go to McDonald's. We well, just got back from Italy. We we found a McDonald's in Florence, and you're like one of the greatest cities in the world to eat, and we're going to go to McDonald's. Okay. I'm like, it's just lunch. Sure, right? the, sure. Uh, you don't have to eat. <laughs> the, uh, but so there's a picture of me in every McDonald's wherever we go. In some countries, they call it uh, the American Embassy. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, it, yeah, I just told you I felt more comfortable in Paris. Not that it was bad. It was a great experience. But when you see the Golden Arches, you go, I recognize that. So do you have any contacts in the corporate headquarters anymore? Are those kind of gone? Yeah. Did you, and, and, and did your um, your grandmother have influence there as well? So I, I'll, the last last story okay. I'll tell you about my my grandmother's influence. My grandmother um, and my mom bought a house together in the villages. Um, had to be twenty five thirty years ago. So villages the villages, in Florida. The villages was just yeah. really kind of getting started. My grandparents lived down in uh, 
uh, Reddington Shores in the Tampa, St. Pete area. And when my grandfather had died, um, uh, my grandmother was getting older. She was in her 90s, still bowling, still playing golf, uh, still going to Vegas a couple times a year. My grandmother was a hoot. Um, the uh, They bought the house together in the villages um, before the villages became what it is now. And uh, uh, she had asked me if I was going to go to work for the company. That's what she always called it. Are you going to go to work for the company when I was graduating from Purdue? And I had interviewed with McDonald's, but I interviewed outside of my market because I, I didn't want uh, I didn't want to get an offer because of who I was, right? So I needed to interview outside of the Lafayette, Indianapolis market where everybody knew who my parents and my grandparents were. And if they knew my parents and grandparents, then they knew about Ray. And so I interviewed outside of the market and I get an offer, probably a, a, what would be a typical offer. Um, I also interviewed with PepsiCo who owned Kentucky Fried Chicken and Taco Bell and, and a number of other companies that owns Corning Fiberglass and retail companies and, and such. And um, so grandma asked me if I was going to work for the company. And I said, well, to tell you the truth, I got a better offer from PepsiCo than I did from McDonald's. And she was, you know, horrified. And um, uh, I, I said, as a stockholder, now I owned a, I owned a lot of stock. We, we got a lot of stock over the years from sure. my grandparents, and I didn't sell it. I, I kept it. I said, this isn't, I don't need this now. I'm going to need this later. And so my concern was as a stockholder. I'd worked at McDonald's all through high school and college. I ran shifts from the time I was 19 years old. I had... I mean, my reviews were always stellar to, to the point that my fellow employees would give me crap about being too oh, good. They'd call me 1.0, <laughs> which is a per perfect rating. And um, at one time they gave me a, a rating uh, of like a 1.2 or 1.4, whatever it was. And, and I, I remember asking my manager, what did I do wrong? Just tell me what I did wrong. I mean, I, I read the McDonald's operating manual and the... <laughs> quarterly report from the time I was 14 years old. I mean, I, I, I would train the people who they, let's say if you were a, a teacher or an engineer and you just decided, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm going to go to work at McDonald's as a manager. I trained those people when they would come in. And then, so recognize that I've got five years of experience, you right. know, working my tail off and look at my evaluations. Uh, don't punish me because I have a college degree. Right. I know, I know what Ray's thought was about college degrees, sure. right? So, but but don't, uh, don't you don't have to pay me more for the college degree, but pay me because I've got five years of experience because I know what you're paying the the engineer who just decides he doesn't want to be an engineer anymore and he's coming to work at McDonald's. He doesn't have my experience. I'm training those, sure. those people. So I tell that story to my grandma and uh, I accept an offer with J.C. Penney to work as a merchandise manager because we're pregnant with our first child and uh, we wanted to stay close to our grandparents. I'm probably, I think I, I I'm, no, I was, I was, my, my salary was $13,000 a year in 1981, $13,000 a year. And, um, uh, I get a phone call this is shortly after my conversation with my grandma at J.C. Penney. Uh, 009, call the office. 09, call the office. That's the, you know, uh, usually there's some issue going on. I call the office and, and uh, she says, there's a Roland Long on the phone for you. Um, s says it's, it's an important call. So I, I come upstairs, I take the phone call. I knew who Roland Long was. He ran at that time the central part of the United States for McDonald's. He was a company guy. My dad and my grandpa hated company guys. <laughs> they hated company guys be because company guys are telling franchisees how to do their job. Sure. And, and franchisees are strong, independent people. So I'd met him at my dad's grand opening. And, 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 and so my influence, the influence of me is he, I don't like him. Sure. And my dad didn't like him. My grandpa didn't like so him. So you don't like him. So he, he says to me, it's, it's actually his secretary says, uh, Mr. Potts, I'm, I'm uh, hold for, for, for uh, Mr. Long. And then he comes on the phone and he says something along the lines of, 
Ed, Ronald Long, I want to let you know that there has been an oversight um, um, somehow or another. Uh, there had been an oversight. We would like to, to fly you out to St. Louis um, and talk about opportunities with the company. And um, I said to him, I've taken another job. Don't ever call me again. Wow. And to me, <laughs> it was my grandpa and my, my dad in my ear. Plus, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, Ray at that time is, you know, um, my dad had, pa had passed. My grandpa, my mom, my grandma were still alive. And Ray was still alive. But I'm thinking, what, what are they going to offer me? And what if, I, what if Ray dies and... Now everybody's going to say the only reason he has his job is because, sure, you know he's part of the family, and uh, so that was that was it. So who knows? Sure. Um, the uh, my point is um, the only reason I got that phone call was because my grandma called Fred Turner and wow. told Fred Turner the same thing that I had told her, which is this is ridiculous. I got a better offer from PepsiCo than I did from McDonald's. And, and that my issue is as a stockholder, if we're missing opportunities to hire somebody who's, who we've seen perform for five years, uh, not offer them a fair a salary compared to what the competition is doing, then we're losing, we're losing good, good yeah. people. Um, but had it been maybe anybody else other than Ronald Long who called yeah. me? so if, when, if it was Uncle Ray. I look at it and say... Uh, in, in our house, we say, you know, it's a God thing when too many things that, too many things that would be fate all come together then, you know. So, uh, you know, there was a reason that phone call came uh, from Roland Long. Sure. And um, the, I just, I just didn't want anything given, given to me. I, I wanted it because I earned it. I, I, w I would rather just give me a fair offer to be a second assistant manager, but pay me more than Taco Bell sure. or whoever, and uh, that that really was the last um, my last interaction, you know, with McDonald's. Other than I still eat at McDonald's five or six times a week, um, <laughs> either breakfast or lunch. Well, you're passionate about the company. I, I love the company. It's your family. I, I'm still a stockholder. Um, when McDonald's stock went public, uh, they when they when they began paying a dividend, they paid a dividend every quarter since they went public, and they've increased that dividend every quarter since they became public. It is one of the, uh, you couldn't have bought a better stock and held it over a long time than McDonald's. I mean, if, if you think about any industry, how over time things will change, and, and we'll use Blockbuster as an example, you know, you go from being dominant, and then things change, and then all of a sudden, now you're not even in business. Nobody in any industry except maybe entertainment and Walt Disney, you know, Disney World, um, has anybody dominated their industry the way McDonald's has. I mean, they haven't lost it and then gotten it back. They have been the top of the chart uh, in that um, category from 1957 forward. Uh, everybody else chases. My grandpa, my dad used to say when we watch a commercial and say um, how they, they'll bash McDonald's. He goes, do you ever hear McDonald's even mention the name of a competitor? Never. No. He goes, you know why? Because we're on top. That's it. Everybody is after who's on top, but we don't talk about Burger King. We don't talk about Wendy's and, uh, and the others. And, and so um, to, to look at, at what that company has done – and you still have naysayers, and I, as a stockholder, I, I, um, I, I voice this to the, to the company. Um, I don't care if you put healthy items on the menu, but don't change my double cheeseburger. Don't change my Big Mac. The, the folks who speak up at these meetings uh, and consider McDonald's to be the reason somebody's overweight or the, the, the reason for any health issues in the United States are all McDonald's, like, why are you going to put items on the menu for people who aren't going to eat at McDonald's anyway? 
Sure. You know what I'm saying? If, if you're a health conscious person, McDonald's is not even on your um, uh, entire, you know, a list of 100 places you go. So why am I going to do something to try to appease you when you're not going to eat there anyway? Just be good at what you're good at. Go And, and, and yesterday, um, as, as I'm listening to the, the stockholders meeting, the, uh, they still quote Ray Kroc at least four times in the, uh, in the uh, uh, session. They, they quoted Ray Kroc mostly about persistence and, and quality and colonialness and things I learned growing up like uh, you got time to lean, you got time to clean. <laughs> that, was, that was said in my house uh, as just when you're getting something out of the refrigerator. You know, the, um, those are uh, Ray Kroc, you know, things. So for me, I mean, he would have been 121 years old um, in October, 121, and he still talked about. Yeah. So despite what my grandpa said in all of the conversations that we have, and I respect my grandfather immensely, is a tremendously successful, what he accomplished owning two franchises uh, and doing it late in life, like like Ray, um, and what they did for their family and for charity, um, um, you know, Part of his issue, he he was they were incredibly successful, but in his own family, he was he was nothing uh, compared to to Ray, and that I'm sure was um, something that that bugged him. But you can't deny, and I would argue, I, I do it when I see a post or something, and and I, if it's about McDonald's, I, I'm probably going to be in there um, defending uh, Ray. Um, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the founder, calling himself the founder, but as far as, as creating what is the McDonald's Corporation, uh, as a worldwide 40,000 locations, I, th- I think, is where we are now. Um, what kind of vision do you have to have? And, and remember, we're talking about someone who didn't graduate from high school, never went to college, Building a, a franchise from scratch, from from one store, one successful store, why wasn't a thousand enough? Why wasn't five thousand enough? Remember, at this point, he's making a boatload of money now because of the the rent coming in from the from the locations. Ten thousand wasn't enough. I mean, you you have to have a vision that I I can't even understand. That s- says why do I need more money? I mean, once you're, you know, I remember my parents telling me he's, he's worth a quarter of a billion dollars, and you're still trying to figure out how much that was back in, in uh, you know, the 70s. And then you look at a quarter of a billion dollars is what he was worth at that time, and then the, what the stock did, she gave away, she gave $100 million to the Ronald McDonald House um, uh, in, in her when she when she died, she gave one and a half billion to the Salvation Army. Wow! So what continued to grow after uh, Ray? Again, uh, uh, to me, he changed American business. And uh, again, the fact that people read his book, somebody like my, my, my friend John Spence, who will list grinding it out as one of the books he would recommend to anybody. And, and John's one of the smartest people I know, and he's suggesting a book written by a guy who wasn't a high school graduate. Uh, so uh, I'm very proud of what he accomplished, and and I will argue that the McDonald's brothers created an iconic restaurant that Ray respected so much that he wanted the name, and he wanted to be he wanted to honor their um, their procedures and their process. And he continued to do that every store he built. He did what the McDonald's brothers did in their original restaurant. They just didn't figure out how to do it with franchises. He did. But he didn't want to change the name either. Right? No, he didn't change the name. He wanted the Golden Arches. He wanted um, – so so when, when Ray would hire you as a franchisee in a McDonald's, you couldn't own a car wash in, in, in a McDonald's. You're, you're going to be involved. You're going to be an owner-operator. And – if he went to that store and it wasn't clean, I mean, uh, he, he'd he raise a stink. And if you weren't doing things the way you were supposed to do it early on, franchisees would 
add different menu items, and he'd have to go out and say, we, we aren't doing that. That was a lot of those conversations between the McDonald's brothers and Ray was somebody wanted hot dogs or somebody wanted uh, pizza or whatever, and, and they – they stuck to the same vendors so that a burger tasted like a burger, had the same bun, the same cheese, the same meat. Um, and his dedication to quality, QSC, quality, service, and cleanliness, to me, is what made the difference. And then you look at McDonald's, became iconic, right? Uh, back when they called them drive-ins, you know, and uh, I love the fact that there are still – you know, they'll open stores with the red and white tile with the arches, the old school stores like the one down on Archer Road. Right. Um, because that's what my which grandparents. Is, which is the road that you don't cross into right. when, when school's in session. <laughs> Stay <laughs> it, off Archer yeah, Road. Exactly. So I didn't like when they changed. When they did indoor seating, then they, they changed the, the whole style. They went with the, the rectangular buildings with the mansard roofs. And I thought they were very unattractive, but they changed. My parents, they changed you know, Brown Street to that that style. But Bruno's Pizza, one of my favorite pizza places in the world in West Lafayette, when uh, they uh, changed the way the roads were routed down on the levee, Bruno's had to move from their location across the street and they bought 212 Brown Street. Mm. So when, they, when, uh, when we went and visited, they uh, let us go down in the basement and the red and white tile is still really? there. Really? Yeah. How cool is that? So they they really didn't change the footprint uh, of the store, but uh, but Bruno um, and my grandfather and my dad and my all of those the people that had the businesses down on the levee are iconic people in Lafayette. Were all my grandpa's buddies, poker buddies, and guys that went to the lodge together and and uh, ran the concrete company, ran the tire company, ran the auto salvage yard. The, um, uh, the dry cleaner, and I'd still see those people, you know, and I would go back uh, to Lafayette. And uh, um, now, you know, those folks have all passed. They were, they were all, um, you know, much older, but my mom's still terrific. She, she still lives in the villages, uh, same, same house. She, uh, uh, she golfs a couple times a week. Wow. She's, uh, she just turned 84. Um, so, uh, She's um, she doesn't talk a lot about it, uh, but she gives me um, a, a mementos uh, as, as she got um, that. I, I think I sent you the picture of that shadow box that she got yep. from Fred Turner's wife when Fred had passed away, um, because you know my mom is is now the would be well her and her cousin would be the two closest blood relatives of, of Ray still still living right. Um, um, so it's a fun story to it tell. It is. It yeah. is. And I appreciate it. So what I find fascinating, Ed, and I appreciate you coming on, is that you, you um, sometimes you think of like, man, I wish I could be a fly on the wall. I wish anybody who watches the movie The Founder didn't get what you just shared just now. Like your family. And so you knew the behind the scenes stuff because that was your family. And that's really cool that you shared it today. That was really awesome. Yeah. It, uh, hopefully it, it has folks go back and watch The Founder kind of in a different from yeah. a different perspective, because at the end, when they throw in the, where it looks like the they the McDonald's brothers signed the contract, and then they they thought they were getting royalties, but they're not. Come on, you're making those guys were too <laughs> smart a business people to sign a contract if they thought they were getting royalties and they weren't. I mean, then shame on the attorney that represented them. Uh, there were never royalties. There there was no way Ray was giving royalties that's the whole reason he was buying them out well hollywood um, has to have their spin on ho it. hollywood has to make it you know more interesting and and uh again to make him look a little bit more uh devious but uh yeah there were people trust me uh because i saw my grandpa my grandpa was one of those people that uh he became really hard to reach towards the end you know you, you had to go through joan to get to him and you couldn't get through joan without going through her people and and um, uh, she really took the charity part away during Ray's last couple of years. So she wanted to make sure she was running the charities. So there's a, a book called Ray and Joan, the man who made the money, the man who made McDonald's and the woman who gave it, gave it away. Uh, wow. It's a great story, but it, it specifically uh, lists in the back all of the 
charitable donations made by Ray and Joan over the last, say, 20 years of their lives. And you can see the focus of the charities change from Ronald McDonald House charities um, to more um, social type sure. uh, charities. Um, and it was her money. She could do with it what she wanted. And, and, um, and let's face it, that money went to charities. Yeah, absolutely. It didn't go to her heirs. Um, they, uh, they were, I'm sure, quite wealthy, but not to the extent that uh, of what she she gave away. Gave away, which says yeah. a lot about their hearts. Mm -hmm. So, cool, Ed. Thank you very much, producer, producer Jake. You've been to the Golden Arches, right? Uh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so he's not going to be the guy that says I haven't heard of it. Who yeah. hasn't heard of it? Yeah. Get your app. Use your McDonald's app. It is. Uh, <laughs> Are you going to use your points today? I, I, I will use my points today. I think I have a dope free free Big Mac today. Really? Yeah. Nice. I, hopefully they bring the Monopoly back when you like scratch stuff off. And I, when, so when I was a kid, they had this. It was, and I'm talking. Uh, I was in third or fourth grade because I remember we lived briefly off Mill Hopper Road in Gainesville, and. It was literally, you could just go get the newspaper. If you bought a newspaper, you could scratch and get a free sandwich. You can get it for it's like, it's free. And they sort of changed it. You can't just get free anymore, mm -hmm. but it was kind of cool. So, Oh, I like the, yeah, the, the, they would do the Olympics. You'd get the scratch off for the Olympics. And if, if the United States finished in the, uh, you know, gold, silver, bronze in the 100 yard, you know, 100 meter dash, it would say you'd get a free Big Mac. I, I'd save all those. Let me I'll be, give you a, a plug to the Alachua at McDonald's. When, when I came to town, Mike Stryker, who, who serves on the board at the Ronald McDonald House with me, owned the store here. And his parents were franchisees. I believe they had Lake City Market and some other markets. So when his parents sold, like mine did, the difference was Mike was old enough to, to stay in the business. So Mike bought that store uh, on uh, at 441 and I-75 in Alachua. Um, was the only store he bought from his parents. But if you're going to buy a store... Buy a store where the interstate exit empties into your parking lot. Right across That's the street. That, you're absolutely right. But M Mike said, and, and I got to know Mike after I moved to town because I ate at McDonald's quite often, and um, uh, I would sit out front and just watch his people work. He, he, runs a, he ran a, a terrific operation. Um, but he, he and I would talk partly about growing up in the McDonald's world um, with parents who were franchisees, and he... He just felt like he was um, a dinosaur because he only he owned just the one store, and now everybody has these conglomerates with multiple franchises. So he always felt like, you know, McDonald's didn't really look at him and his particular situation the way they might look at somebody who owned 10, 10 franchises. So Mike sold his store a few years ago, but I'm, I'm telling you, I go to McDonald's a lot, and no store. If you go through the drive through at the store here in Alachua, if you touch the fries um, while you're driving, they are so hot you, will, you, you won't even be able to hold on to them until you get them to your mouth. And so I used to joke to Mike and said, how do you, how, how do you consistently give the hot fries to the drive through Because I've eaten inside and they're, the, the fries are great, but they're not that hot. How does the drive through like, get their own hot fries? He would never tell me. He just said, everybody gets the fries at the same time. And I'm like, BS. <laughs> no, yeah. So that store still, they they have maintained that quality and cleanliness. So the store is franchised. It's franchised by a different owner than the Gainesville folks. Um, I, don't, I don't know the owner, but I can tell you that many of the managers are still there and the employees are still there. So you want great fries, the best fast food fries, period. But- Three ninety nine. When they're when they're, when they're hot with uh, the right amount of salt, uh, go go to the Alachua McDonald's and and then my my last plug is for the Ronald McDonald House here in Gainesville and Ron, Ronald McDonald House is across the country. I mean, how how can you not support a, a charity that focuses on keeping extremely sick children close to their uh, families and in in our case close to you know one of the finest children's hospitals you know, in the world in, at, at UF Shands, the, um, uh, to me, post-retirement, when I started my retirement, and I'll, and I'll finish officially in October, uh, my number one, you know, goal in retirement was to, to serve on the Ronald McDonald House board. And um, it just, the timing worked out. And I, I, I got a call from Sherry Houston um, a couple years ago, and um, 
I'm quite sure it was uh, John Spence uh, uh, who was probably involved in that. His wife was exiting the board and uh, exiting the board right as I was entering retirement. And I, I'm quite sure that was that was a, a setup. So for me, uh, you know how much I love McDonald's, the, the ability to kind of tie a, 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 a knot in that circle sure. um, with my family's um, relationship with McDonald's, my love for the restaurant and the, the corporation. Um, um, I mean, it's the finest board of directors and we have uh, tre tremendous charities in, in our, our city, but, but there is no board full of more uh, quality individuals than, than the Ronald McDonald House board. So that was the other part of it. You know, I, I want to be on a board with people who I, I, I trust uh, their integrity, their, uh, their uh, focus on the mission, and that they're not doing it to, to simply have something on their, their resume. And uh, we're in the midst of uh, a major capital campaign. We're moving the house so we can add uh, uh, more rooms for our families. We're at capacity 365 days a year, 80 families on our waiting list right now. Wow. So we're not going to clear that. But, uh, but, uh, but we'll add 25 rooms with the ability to grow even, even further beyond that in the future. Uh, and we're really just moving down around the, the corner to uh, what was the Hope Lodge, a cancer treatment facility. So we're in the middle of a, a renovation, and our families will, will be moving. Uh, we'll be in the house by Labor Day. So, wow. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. I think what's interesting, too, is uh, I'll leave it with this, that I don't know if all the board members even know that you – in your relationship with the Ray Kroc McDonald's family, Hand, handful, yeah, um, and it's not something you just put out there. And I, I we had talked, I think, over, well over a year ago, and I, or maybe two years, I don't know. And it's like, wow, you don't you don't share that openly, and I, which says a lot about you. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate you taking the time to come do that today, because sure, um, I actually look when I look at Ray Kroc and I look at the family, especially Ray Kroc, I don't look at him and go, um, I don't like him. I go, I respect him because he had a, a dream and a vision, and he attacked it. And uh, he did very, very well. And then at the end of the day, they gave away their fortune to mm -hmm. charity. Mm -hmm. So, And he did all of that starting at age 52. Wow. And, and remember, he really, you know, my, my dad worked for McDonald's for 25 years, and he died at 42, right? Ray only worked for McDonald's for 30 years. <laughs> uh, so what he did and what he did in a, really an incredibly short period of time um, is, uh, to me, um, th that's kind of overlooked, sure. right? But yeah, he was 52, and I, I guarantee you, at 52, I had already sold my first business and contemplated retiring until I got here and uh, realized that I was going to be running around our two youngest <laughs> to eight zillion different activities, and uh, I said, I got to get back to having some control of my schedule. So I was fortunate and, and was able to uh, to represent Edward Jones here in uh, uh, Alachua. But uh, at 52, I was looking more towards retirement, not at, at, at just beginning yeah. something that took a tremendous amount of work uh, and vision um, and and to go from from a guy who was made fun of by his buddies at the country club because of all of his failed inventions to being one of the most influential people in the 20th century uh, is, uh, yeah, a crazy story. Cool. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thanks, Ed. I appreciate you being here. All right. I know a guy podcast, and uh, that's, that's this episode. Cool. Thank you.